So Ecclesiastes chapter 12 is where we're going to be. Um, but while you're, you're flipping there, I want us to pray together and uh, just ask that uh, let's just put everything else aside for the next several minutes, a few minutes, and, and uh, let's just dive into what God would have us to say as we wrap up what's been a great 15-week study in the book of Ecclesiastes. So let's, let's pray together. God, we thank you for your word, that it's your word that reigns supreme. And that, uh, Father, no matter what life throws at us, we know that your word is firm. And today, Father, we get to the end of the matter. Fear the Lord and keep his commands. At the end of it being all said and done, we're called to fear you and keep your commands. And so, Lord, let that be true of us. And we ask all this in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. If there's no God, then there's no judge. If there's no judge then there will be no final judgment. If there's no final judgment, there's no ultimate meaning to life. Nothing matters. This is the the logic of an argument in the book After the Fall by Arthur Miller, where one of the characters goes on to say this, for many years I looked at my life at at like a case at law. There was a series of proofs. When you're young, you prove how brave you are or how smart you are. Then what a good lover or husband or, or wife you may be then a good father, and finally, how wise or how powerful. But underlying it all, I, now, I see now there was a presumption that one moved on an upward path towards some elevation where God knows what I would be justified or even condemned. A verdict anyway. I think now that my disaster really began when I looked up one day and, at the, be- and the bench was empty. No judge in sight. And all that remained was endless argument with oneself this pointless litigation of existence before an empty bench, which of course is another way of saying despair. If there's no God to judge the world, then human existence is pointless. It's a pointless litigation that ends in meaningless despair. And I think that Solomon, who wrote Ecclesiastes, would agree with that. If there's no God, there's no judgment, then what's the point? And if you know, we've been going through the book of Ecclesiastes for the past 15 weeks, and, and, and we've been on a roller coaster ride. And I say that we've been on a roller coaster ride because we've gone through the ups and downs of life. What does it mean to have true life under the sun? What does it mean to be truly joyful in this life? Where does our, our source and meaning of life come from? And so today we get to the bottom of that. But before we get to that, I want to say there's no way that we can make sense of our lives under the sun without wisdom from beyond the sun. That has been really what we've talked about throughout this entire book. We need the Lord to give us wisdom in our lives. If we don't have a why or a purpose or a meaning behind what we do in our life, we'll ultimately look to things like hobbies, sports, and other things, sex and relationship, food, and other things that try to give us purpose and meaning, but the problem is it only leads us empty. And this is what we do. We look to things outside of God to try to propose meaning in life. And the problem is, is it blinds us to the true purpose that God has for us in this life. The problem is when we chase after the things of this world, when we, when we chase after things, we're left empty and feeling void because those things were never meant to truly satisfy us. And this is what Solomon has been arguing all throughout the book of Ecclesiastes. You go chase after those things, but you're only going to be left empty. Vanity, he says. He began the book with vanity. And if you look in the text right before we start today, we're going to be in chapter 12, verses 9, uh, starting in verse 9. But before that, he finishes the book by saying absolute futility. Everything is futile or everything is vanity. And as we close this book, we're going to get tonight, today, to the end of the matter. And we're going to move on. But... But here's where I want us to challenge us. I want us to think about it. We're going to summarize the entire book, the entire study we've been looking at. But I want to ask you this question. What is your why in life? Ever thought about that? What is your true purpose in life? This is what we're going to talk about. What, why do we do what we do? In other words, why are you here? Why do we wake up in the morning? Why do we go to our job? Why do we have kids? Why do we have a family? Why do we do what we do? What drives you? Because church, my fear is this, is that there are many people that live in this life or live their entire life, even believers, going through the motion of work, school, church. And if you ask them why they do it, they can't give you an answer. And so I want to rascal, I want us to sit in that tension here this morning. But I'm here to tell you that each of us have a purpose and a meaning in our life. We just have to filter it through a proper understanding of life. 
an understanding of life under the sun. Everything under the sun is vanity or meaningless without channeling it through who God is and who he created you to be. So what is your why? What is your purpose? What is our purpose? Over the last several weeks, Solomon has shown us what the purpose of life isn't. And today, we're going to see what it truly is. Are you ready for it? Yeah. Let's stand together. And if you're physically able to stand, stand with me. We're going to be looking at Ecclesiastes chapter 12. We're going to be all in this passage this morning. But I want to focus specifically on the end of the matter the conclusion of the matter, which is this. Look at tw- verses 12, or chapter 12, verses 13 through 14. And here's what it says. When all has been heard, the conclusion of the matter is this. Fear God and keep his commands. Because this is for all humanity. For God will bring every act to judgment, including everything, whether good or evil. Main idea today, fear God, keep his commands. But there's two reminders that we get here this morning. The first one is this. We find true wisdom in life in God's word. And then secondly, we find true purpose by fearing God and keeping his commands. Let's ask for God to show us some things here this morning. God, your word. You've given it to us. There's wisdom in it. Father, I pray that each one of us would value it above all things in life. Father, help us to grow in love with your word, to equip us to go out and make you known. Be with us this morning, Father. We want to hear from you. We don't want to hear from a pastor, no preacher. We want to hear from you, Lord. And so, Lord, we're at your table. We pull up a seat to you today. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. So let's talk about that. Find true wisdom in God's word. Look at verse, we'll start in verse nine. Here's what he says. It says, in addition to the teacher being a wise man, he constantly taught the people knowledge. He weighed, explored, and arranged many proverbs. The teacher sought to find delightful sayings and write words of truth accurately. The sayings of the wise are like cattle prods. That those, uh, and those from the master's collections are like firmly embedded nails. These sayings are given by one shepherd. But beyond these, in verse 12, it says, Be warned, there's no end to the making of many books. Much study wearies the body. Now, uh, keep in mind, now, why why are we all of a sudden talking about the teacher? Well, a lot of people believe that Solomon didn't necessarily write this section. Some believe that he did. Um, But that's not really the point. But it's kind of like an epilogue. And so we're we're at the end of the book. We're kind of getting a summary of what's been going on. And then we get to the final conclusion. But I want you to notice what it says in verses 9 and 10. In 9 and 10, the writer reminds us that the teacher Solomon was wise. And that he also taught with great knowledge. And we get the idea here that he reflected deeply on the truths that he wrote down. And, that, and, and they were written and he took delight as he wrote them. And he arranged the words and it was done so accurately. So, so what, is this, what is this writer talking about? What's going on here? He's talking about God's word. He's talking about writing down God's word. He, Solomon would teach and do it with great wisdom and care. And we have all that in the wisdom literature, not only in Ecclesiastes, but we also see it in Proverbs and we see it in Song of Songs. But what I really want us to focus on here is verse 11. He said, the sayings of the wise are like cattle prods and those from the master's collections are firmly embedded nails that these sayings are given by one shepherd. So let's, let's put all this together. We've got Solomon, a book that was written by the wisest man that many believe to ever live, although he didn't make great decisions all the time, but he's considered the wisest man to ever live. But it was, but it was written by him. But this, tells, this text tells us that, that the sayings were given by one shepherd. Y'all, who is the shepherd? All right, the shepherd is Jesus. Or the shepherd is God. Remember what David said in Psalm 23, 1. He said, the Lord is my shepherd. And so we have a reminder here that the word of God was written by the hands of men. Yes. Under the divine inspiration of the Holy spirit. Yes. But it was also written from the words of the one shepherd God who what he would have them to write. We have a reminder here of the authority of scripture and what scripture really is. And and church, I want to tell you today, if, if this isn't the bedrock to everything that we have, then I have to ask the question, what are we doing? Because God's word stands supreme. Remember what it says in 2 Timothy 3.16. It says, all scripture is inspired by God, profitable for teaching, rebuking, for correcting, and for training in righteousness. 
Andrew, why are you saying all this? I'm saying this because God has given us all we need through his word to understand life under the sun. We have all of it right here written in his word. If we claim to believe in him, then we must make it a priority to read it and meditate on it. And so here's my question. How well do we value God's word? I've used this illustration before. There's a New Testament professor at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Um, Some of you go there. I understand that. I wouldn't recommend taking this guy, but his name's Bart Ehrman. And every year, every year, Bart asks it. He's the the distinguished professor of New Testament. He's also an atheist, doesn't believe in anything. All right, so there's there's where we're at with that. But he, he asked all of his students this question. He said, how many of you have ever read the Bible it's, it, or believe that the Bible is the inspired word of God? How many of you believe the Bible is the inspired word of God? Everybody in the room, they raise their hand. And then he'll say, how many of you have ever read The Hunger Games by Suzanne Collins or some other popular book? And then, uh, you know, uh, all the hands go up in the air. And he's like, okay, I, I get that. How many of you have read the Bible? This time, very few hands go up. And he's like, wait a minute, you mean to tell me that you believe that the Bible is the inerrant, infallible Word of God. If God wrote a book, wouldn't you want to read it? Recent Lifeway study says that one in five people that go to church, and when I mean go to church, they're here all the time. One in five actually have read the Bible before. God's given us a book. And I I, I don't agree with, with Bart definitely don't agree with his theology or theological approach, but I do give credit to the man for asking the question. So how serious are we taking God's word? Are we reading it? Are we meditating on it? God has literally given us through the writings of Solomon, what we call wisdom literature. Again, Ecclesiastes, Proverbs, Song of Songs, and a collection of writings with the sole purpose of understanding the complexities of life under the sun. But statistically, many of us aren't reading it. Books written by the wisest man to ever live, under the inspiration of the one who created all things. And as one person once said, to reject that and to do things our own way takes some kind of pride. Many of you know that I like golf. And while I'm not good at golf anymore, I spent six summers teaching at one of the top junior golf camps in the world. I'm good at teaching golf now. I'm not good at playing it. Um, You can ask Stu. I told him this week was not pretty. But anyway, my point is, is let's say that um, my daughter, Addie, sitting right over here, but let's say that she goes and says, hey, hey, dad, dad, I want to I want to learn how to play golf. That would be the greatest words ever spoken by my daughter. Amen. Anyway, so let's say I want to go play. I'm like, OK, great. So we get her a, a little junior set of golf clubs and then um, we go out to the driving range and we start to hit golf balls. Well, let's say that while I'm out there, Tiger Woods, arguably the greatest golfer of all time, walks up on the driving range and says, um, hey, you're, you're teaching your kid. That, that's awesome. Can I give you a few pointers? And I look at Tiger Woods and I say, nah, man, I got this. I taught junior golf for six years. <laughs> Y'all going to be like, man, you're crazy, right? Like, you, like, what kind of pride? Like, there's a lot of pride in that statement. Like, I got this. You don't worry about it. That would be nuts. Listen, close church, the wisdom of God's right here in this book. Yeah. Are we going to open it and accept it, or are we going to disregard it and keep living life our way? That's, right. that's, that's the challenge that we see right here in the book of Ecclesiastes. Now, I'm not going to ask for a poll here, but I, I'm going to assume that probably many of us in the room, believers in Jesus, can relate to that question that that professor at UNC Chapel Hill asked his students. Do you believe the Bible is true? Yes. Do you believe the, the Bible is infallible and inerrant? Yes, I believe that. Do you read it? Well... The most common feedback that I get in this area is, is I just don't have time. I don't have time. Well, we've got time for the news. We've got time for sports. We have time for other hobbies. We've got time for YouTube, for gaming, for working out, and so many things. But we don't have time to sit and hear from the very Word of God. Church, that takes some kind of pride. And what we see here is there's wisdom in that. There's wisdom in this. Again, just calling it like it is. We make time for what we value in life. And one in five churchgoers actually read the Bible. I go as far as to say that there's many of us who don't value God's word. And that is a product of our heart. And so where is our heart? 
Verse, verse 11 in chapter 12, it's, let's, let's move forward. It says, The saying of the wise are like cattle prods, and those from the master's collections are like firmly embedded nails. These sayings are given by one shepherd. Now, I grew up in God's country, Bladen County. That's right. Okay. Well, all we have down there are farms and Melvin's hamburgers and White Lake on occasion whenever it's not crowded. Now, I grew up on a farm. I come from a family of farmers. And one thing you learn to use, we didn't have cattle, but one thing, you, if you have cattle, you've got to learn how to use a cattle prod. Now, a cattle prod is this long stick with an end on it. It looks like a fork. Now, so, nowadays, they actually have a little electric shock that goes on them, but that's beside the point. But why do you use that? Because you have to help steer the, the cows in the direction that you want them to go or whatever animal that you're trying to get them to go in a certain direction. And, and think about this. In light of the Bible in our Christian life, the Word of God, what we see right here in Ecclesiastes is the Word of God is the cattle prod that shapes us and moves us to places that we don't want to go or even places that we won't even consider to go. Why? Because the unknown is scary. Yeah. It's scary. Yet at the same time, God knows what's good for us. And we find that in his word through our, our devoted quiet time with him. And this goes back to what I talked about a few weeks ago about being bold and taking risk. We do this for the glory of God. God's word shapes us. It moves us. It transforms us from the inside out. But look at what else it says. It says, and those from the master's collections are like firmly embedded nails. The word nails here, you can think of tent pegs. If you go camping or you're putting something in the ground, what's the purpose of a tent peg? It holds a tent in the ground, right? That, that's, what, that's the image that we have here. It's this idea of a shepherd's tent being stable to keep it from being blown away in the storm. And the collected sayings give stability and security to one's life. Church, God's word serves as our anchor in the storms of life. And I can't tell you how many times I talk to people and they're talking about all these different things that are going on in their life. Pastor, I need help with this. I need help with that. And, and trust me, I, I love sitting down in conversations like that. I do. It's an open invitation. Anybody ever wants to come and talk about things, I'm, I'm here. But a lot of times when I come down to the question of, well, are, are you spending time in prayer? Are you, are, are you meditating on God's word? Are you seeking him out there? Well, well, no, but I got all these other things going on. If we're not being held by the anchor, then we're not being held by anything. And as James says, we just get kind of blown around through trials and struggles. The word never changes. It never moves. And what good news we have in this. I know in, in my life and in many of yours, we find comfort and rest in God's word just this week. I'll be honest with you. It's going to be one of the hardest weeks I've ever had to go through because I have no idea what's going to happen today. Not that that really matters. I'm secure in what God's called me to do. That's, that's fine. It'd be an honor to serve here. And I'll just address the elephant in the room. Like, it'd be an honor to serve here, to be your pastor, because I know that's what God's called me to do. But whether he's called me to do that here, or if he's got something else, I, reflect, I was even thinking about that this morning. And I was like, you know what, God? Your word says that you know my plans. You've already crafted that. And so why do we worry about it? And then this week, I was talking to my discipleship group about this, and we were talking about anxiety and the unknowns of future, because the reality is... We may think that we know what the future holds, but none of us really do. It doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't matter what job or career you have. But then I literally on, on Wednesday morning read Matthew six thirty four, where Jesus says, don't worry about tomorrow. Don't, don't worry because about each day. Uh, or don't worry about tomorrow because tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble on its own. And so we're, we're reminded not to be anxious, not to worry. Church, we need these reminders and it's God's word. That's how God speaks to us through his word. He gives us comfort in those storms. He's the anchor in the storm. He's the nail that'll keep you from falling off the wall. And while he's given this to us freely, we can't tap into it if we don't know it. And we can't tap into it if we're not applying it to our lives. So a couple of applications here real quick, and then we're going to move on. I want to encourage you, if you're not reading the Bible right now, start reading on a reading plan. Yeah. The F260 plan, the reason why we like that plan here is because it's simple. It's, it's literally one or two chapters a day, five days a week. And so there's a resource there for you, but it doesn't have to be that plan. There's other reading plans out there. Start somewhere. If, if you're not comfortable reading a chapter a day, start with a devotion. Read a, read a, pa a, a short passage a day. Uh, it, it, and maybe you need to start reading a, a proverb a day. You know, literally one of those a day. If you're a parent, I want to encourage you to start reading the Bible and praying with your kids. We can provide resources for that. Brittany and I literally just take a kid's Bible built around the age of, of Addie, and we just read it to her every night. And we pray over her every night with her. Those things go a long way. And, and if you have older kids, maybe do the F260 plan as a family. I know some of you do that, and that's, that's awesome. Begin to soak up God's Word. Meditate on it. The reality is we make time for what's important. 
Allow it to shape who you are. And we, and we say this a lot around, around here. In fact, I think I'm the reason why we say it. But we get into the Word so the Word can get into you. And why do we say that? Because it's true. The more we're in it, the more we learn from it. The more we learn from it, the more we apply it. The more we apply it, the more we live it out. And so we find true wisdom in God's Word. Look at verse 12. We'll keep moving. It says, But beyond these, my son, be warned that there's no end to the making of many books and much study wearies the body. Now, before I say what I'm about to say here, uh, I want you to know, like many of you in the room, I read a lot of books outside of reading the Bible. But, the, but, um, and so I, I've got nothing wrong with that. There's, there's no problem with that. Um, I believe God's gifted many scholars and many teachers in certain areas to help us learn and grow in certain areas. But while these books are good, we've got to be careful not to overlook the one true book. God's Word. It gives us wisdom and purpose for our life. God's Word. Today, there are more than a million books published every year. A million. And so what the Bible, if, if, so what the Bible says is true. The making of many books, there is no end. And studying all those is enough to wear anybody out. And trust me, there is a place in Christian discipleship for all these other books and things like that. And I'm, and I'm cool with that. In fact, I recommend a lot of them. But we have to remember that human wisdom and man-made philosophy are limited. But God, we tap into the knowledge of God and we get everlasting life when we read his word. So by far the most important book to study is God's word, including everything written in Ecclesiastes and the wisdom literature. But be careful trying to go further than the word of God. So many people I run into you true, try to find purpose and meaning in life through so many books outside the Bible. Did you know that the self-help section of a bookstore is the largest section of the bookstore? It's actually the first thing you see when you walk in. Because everybody's looking for, how can I, do, how can I grow in this area? And, and what, what can I, what, what, what can I, I do to, differently to, to get better? Because people are looking for a better way. But the problem is, when you start looking into those self-help books and things like that for wisdom in life, it's limited. God's given us that through his word. The purpose is right here. The people are looking for purpose when they're going for stuff like that. And God's purpose is right here in his word. He gives it to you. Why are you here? I've said it once. I'll say it again. We're here to use the gifts and talents that God has gifted us to make him known. That's it. We honor him and we make him known. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, that's, that's our purpose. That's our why. And God graciously invites us into a relationship with him. And when we accept Jesus who lived and died and rose again on our behalf, we take the gospel and then we allow that to shape and transform us literally from the inside out. We start seeing our jobs as a place to make him known. We see our homes as a place to train our, the next generation of our kids to come and make him known. We start to see our churches as a place to let go of personal preferences and as a place where each week we come and we're equipped and we're sent out into the world to make Jesus known. That's what it's about. That's the power of the gospel. To let go of our personal preferences, to let go of uh, all the pride that swells up in our heart and focus on, okay, God, how can I make you known and glorify you today? Church, this is our purpose, and we discover that in God's Word and His Word alone, it is the Word of God that true wisdom from God is given to us, and it makes life under the sun make sense. And so we see here a reminder that true wisdom in life is in God's Word, but we also see the end of the matter. We find true purpose by fearing God and keeping His command. So let's dive into that. I love how this book lands and ends with so much simple truth, so much practicality here. What are we to do in this life? We've heard for the past 15 weeks, Solomon has said, and, and, and he's like, you know, here, here's the why. What do we do? This is what you don't do. Now he says, here's what we do do. Here's how we respond. 13. He says, when all has been heard, the conclusion of the matter is this. Fear God and keep his commands. This is for all humanity. For God will bring every act to judgment, including every hidden thing, whether good or evil. Church, this is what life is about. It's what everything in life is about. In fact, we could, have, we, we could have literally jumped to the end of the book right here and saved 15 weeks of diving into this book. But I'm glad we didn't. The most important thing for any one of us to do is to worship God and obey His commands. This is more simply than just duty. According to one person, it says it is the whole happiness and, busy, busy, and busyness, the total sum of all that concerns a person, all that re God requires of him, all that the Savior enjoys, all that the Holy Spirit teaches and works with him. The greatest thing is to come before the one true God and worship him in obedience. Fear God and keep his command. The end of the matter is not success. The end of the matter is not a 401k plan. 
The end of the matter is not food. The end of the matter is not marriage. No, the end of the matter is to fear God. And what, so let's talk about that for a second. What does it mean to fear God? Basically, to fear God means to be in awe of God. To be in awe of recognizing that who God is in light of the gospel of Jesus Christ, we're drawn close to him as a result. It's, it's not fear in a sense of being afraid. It's not fear in a sense of, of, of the unknowns of things. It's, it's grasping the truths of God's word, and it's applying these things to our lives. We, we focus on growing closer to him because we trust that his ways are better than our own. As one pastor said it, and I love this because it's so simple and I like being simple, we just take God seriously. Yeah. That, that's it. That's the fear of God is what that means. Church, this is what we're called to do in life. And so let me ask another question. Do we do that? Do we fear God and keep his commands? Do we truly fear him? Are we leading our homes as if this is the end of the matter? Do we view life under the sun through the goggles of fearing God and keeping his commands? Because what we've seen in the book of Ecclesiastes is, is that life only has a purpose and meaning when we fear God and keep his commands. And so do we do that? And then finally, we get to the last verse. It says, for God will bring every act to judgment, including every hidden thing, whether good or evil. And so why fear God and keep his command? The reality is because each of us one day, whether we believe in God or not, are going to stand before him and receive judgment for everything in our life. He'll expose everything about our life. Every secret that we wanted to hide will be revealed. Every rock in our life where we try to hide something, it's going to be flipped over. And it's going to be there and exposed. Every word that we've ever said is going to be brought back up. And if you remember, Solomon has brought this day of judgment up before. In, in, in uh, chapter 11, in verse 9, he says, Rejoice, young person, while you're young. Let your heart be glad in the days of your youth. Walk in the ways of your heart and in the desire of your eyes. But know that for all these things, God will bring you to judgment. So he's basically saying, hey, go do what you want to do. But you're still going to stand before judgment at some point. Why bring this up? Church, listen again, because everything in life matters. The, the, the preacher, Solomon, started this by saying, the spiritual quest by saying everything is vanity. Everything's vanity under the sun. But what we see here, and he goes on further to say that without God, there's no meaning or purpose to life. It's all there is. He kept asking, is there more to life than what I see under the sun? And the answer to that is yes. Remember what I said at the beginning. If there's no God then therefore there's no final judgment. If that's the case, it's hard to see how anything in life matters. But if there is a God who will judge the world, then everything matters. All of life matters. So many of us are tirelessly searching for the meaning and purpose of life. And what Solomon tells us here at the end of the matter, after all is said and done, it says you and I are created to worship him. We're created to fear him. We're created to live in all of him and to be obedient to his commands. And this links back to why I spent so much time on the front end talking about God's word. Because we can't follow his commands if we don't know his commands. But we got to be in his word. The final message of Ecclesiastes is not that nothing matters, but everything does. Everything matters. The end of the matter is that everything matters. Everything that we do in life has eternal significance. Everything. And the reason why everything matters is because everything in the universe is subject to a final judgment of a righteous God who knows every secret. This life is not all there is. It's not. There's an eternal God in heaven who is ruling on a throne, and one day he is going to come back. And by the way, he's not out to get you. In fact, John 3.16 says that he loved you so much that he sent his son to die for you. I'm sorry, but a God can't be an angry God who's willing to sacrifice his own child. Whoever believes in him won't perish, but they will have eternal life. God sent Jesus into this world to give you and I hope of life under the sun, to give us meaning under the sun. Jesus came, he lived a a sinless life and was sentenced to death on a cross. He died a horrible death that you and I deserve, but the Bible tells us that God did that because he loves us. He loves us. And Jesus not only died and was buried, three days later again, he rose from the grave overcoming sin and death. How do we find purpose and meaning in this life? It comes from a complete surrender that's only found in the gospel of Jesus Christ. A complete surrender. The reality is so many look to other things to fill that void. God is the only one who can truly fill it. Has he filled that void in your life? The end of the matter is 
a relationship with Jesus. Why were you created? To be in a relationship with God. And as a result of that relationship, we live our lives to bring honor and glory to him. Church, that's it. This is why time and time again, every time I'm up here, I'm always challenging you to start seeing where you are and where God's placed you to view life as being on mission in that area. Because that's what we're called to do. That's that's all we're called to do. It's a relationship with Jesus. And through that relationship, we're to live out the gospel in our daily lives, and then that changes our outlook on everything. We begin to see our lives with purpose. We begin to see our lives with, with, a, uh, with a different outlook, and purpose is to glorify Him with the gifts, the talents, and the opportunities that He's given us. Why are we here? That's it. What's our purpose? Love God, love Jesus, make Him known. Fear God and keep His commands. That's the end of the matter. I love reading biographies, and I'll close with this. I love reading biographies about missionaries, um, mostly in part because Brittany and I at one time thought we were going to go overseas. It was our goal, our desire, was to, um, to go overseas and be in some of the hardest-to-reach places for the gospel because if nobody has, is going there to tell them, I wanted to go there and tell somebody. Nick Rick, Ripkin, is a, um, he wrote a book called The Insanity of God, and uh, it's about his experience in the 90s living in war-torn Somalia. Things were so bad that the United Nations were actually pulling out. They wouldn't go in. This was after Black Hawk Down and all that kind of stuff that happened back then. The U.S. were even pulling out. But he, ca- he felt compelled to go in for the sake of Christ. In the book, he tells a story of four believers who he befriended in the country, and it was one of the greatest experiences in his life was sharing the Lord's Supper with them. And so what Nick would, uh, he would have to leave for a few days, and once he returned, he came back and he heard some horrible news. Somebody came in, and this is what they told him. They said, I've been informed this morning that four Somalian believers that we've worked with and we've had contact with were killed. But they were killed in separate instances, and they were ambushed on their way to work. We've notified, um, we've been notified that if our organization doesn't pull out, this was the Christian uh, mission group that was working in that area, that if we don't pull out, everyone who works for us will be killed. It was confirmed that it was a, a radical extremist group in that area that did that. And so Nick was devastated at the news of losing his friends, and so he goes outside And he starts looking around, and he's really faced with a a, a critical moment in his life. Do I go home? Do we stay? What do we do? And he said in that moment, God didn't audibly speak to him. He said, but he he felt this in his heart. And this is what he he wrote in the book. He said, Nick, and he, he said this was God kind of touching him here. God told him, he said, Nick, you were no less lost than they are. But by my grace, you were born in an environment where you could hear, understand, and believe. And he said, these people haven't had the opportunity. And so he was also reminded of these words from Scripture, that even while you were a sinner, Christ died for you. And so then he had this thought, not only did Christ die for me, and Christ died for us, he said, but it also for everyone in Somalia and the Horn of Africa that God had called him to serve. What would compel somebody to go to the hardest of reaches places in the world to tell somebody about Jesus? Fear the Lord and keep his commands. What would compel someone to see their workplace, to reach others for the sake of the gospel? Fear the Lord and keep his commands. What would compel a mother and a father to see their role as parents, to equip their kids to be mission-minded? Fear the Lord and keep his commands. What would compel a high school or middle school student to go and tell their friends about Jesus? Fear the Lord and keep his commands. Church, this is the power of the gospel. When we truly begin to fear God, and we sit in awe of Him, and we begin to follow Him and trust Him, we're, compared, com- we're compelled to see life differently under the sun. We see that life is meaningful, not meaningless. We see the main point of Ecclesiastes here is to fear God and keep His commands. But we also see the reminder that true wisdom comes from God, and our true purpose in life is to fear Him and keep His commands. And so, as we bring this to a close today... I just want to ask that question again. What's our why? What's our purpose? Do we fear God in every area of our life? Are we willing to to allow the Word of God to, to shape us and point us to maybe to some difficult places where we don't want to go because the fear of the unknown is scary? We just sang at the beginning of this service talking about God is Lord over all. Well, if He's Lord over all, then all means all things. 
including our lives. So, fear God and keep His commands. Let's pray together. God, Your Word is great. Your Word is true. Father, we're grateful that we have it. And we, we can see the beauty and wonders of Your creation as we open our eyes and we walk out into the world, but God, You gave us more than that. Not only do we see Your beauty in creation, but we also see it through Your written divine inspired word that's been like nails that hold firm and so God I just pray that we would be a church my desire that we would be a church that's about the word that we would stand and let that be our foundation not getting caught up in human philosophy and purposes and other things out there that that split so many churches and denominations and believers apart Father, I truly believe is that if we, if we lift and elevate your word, not only as a church body, but individually as believers, that our church, no matter who's leading it, who you called here to lead it, will be led in a way that honors you. God, I pray the day if somebody today heard your gospel, heard the good news for the first time today, that they'd say, you know what? I haven't been fearing God. I haven't been keeping his commands. But I hope that they would know that, Father, that you are just so gracious and loving that they're not too far gone to turn, to come to you and be welcomed in where we'll stand before judgment, not look at our faults and our failures and our imperfections, but we'll be clean because of your son, Jesus. If that's you out here today, then I want to encourage you in your own heart. Would you pray something like this? Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I know that I've kind of ventured off the path a little bit. But Father, I need you to take over my life. I want to surrender my life to you. Forgive me for my sin. Forgive me for my rebellion. Forgive me for running away. And help me, Lord, to follow you, trust you, to fear you and keep your commands. If that's you today, I want to encourage you. There's many of us in the room today, pastors, deacons down front, before we get to the church vote stuff, if that's you today, I want to come and encourage you to come talk to us. There's nothing more important than praying that prayer and making that decision than anything else going on today. If you're not comfortable necessarily coming forward, I get that. There's a lot of stuff going on up here. I want to encourage you, if you prayed that prayer, just look up here for a second. There on the screen, there's a, 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 a text that you can send to the number 84576 that says next step. If you text that, it's got a bunch of different next steps that you could take. Maybe you place your trust in Christ. Maybe you need prayer. Maybe you're interested in joining the church. Uh, maybe uh, you're looking to get baptized. We, w- we want to meet, help meet that need. If that's you today, if you'll send that text message, I promise you, uh, Pastor Jeff will follow up with you this week. You will get in contact. And so I want to encourage you to do that. And lastly, if you've been in church, been a believer for a long time, Let's use this as a moment of reflection. And let's ask God to reveal to us what areas of our own life have we not been given over to Him? Do some deep self-reflection and just know that we're here to lay it at the feet of Jesus. Let's fear Him. Let's keep His commands. God, I thank You for our church. I thank You for our team of leadership here. But Father, most importantly, we thank you to be a part of a church that's led by your word. And we're thankful to be a part of a church that loves you and is looking for ways to serve you. We lift all this up to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.